Get ready for all the craziness of small business. It's exactly that craziness that makes it exciting and totally unbelievable. Small Business Radio is now on the air with your host, Barry Moltz. Well, thanks for joining this week's radio show. Remember, this is the final word in small business. For those keeping track, this is now show number 567. A happy new year, 567. This episode, of course, is provided by Nextiva, the all-in-one communications platform for your small business. It's also sponsored by LinkedIn, the place to generate leads, drive traffic, and build your brand awareness for a free $100 credit to launch your campaign. Go to www.linkedin.com slash SBR. It's also supported by eFile4Biz, the easiest way to electronically process and file your 1099s and W-2s for your business. Go to www.efile4biz.com. It's also sponsored by Vsita. All you need to run your business in a tiny little app. Try for free at www.vsita.com. That's the letter V-C-I-T-A.com. It's also supported by Blue Supplies. I'm going to have to take that one more time, that last thing. Can I just say the last thing? Okay. Blue Summit Supplies. Get your IRS 1099 and W-2 forms. Go to Blue Summit Supplies slash SBR. Well, we wanted to kick this year off with one of the most explosive entrepreneurs of our time. Mark Randolph is the co-founder of Netflix, serving as their founding CEO, as the executive producer of their website, as a member of their board of directors until his retirement in 2004. He's got a new book out. It's called... That Will Never Work, The Birth of Netflix and the Amazing Life and of Idea. Mark, welcome to the show. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Uh, explosive? Explosive. Yeah, like that one. Explosive, of course. Well, <laughs> you know, I love the title of your book because we hear that all the time when we come across entrepreneurs, and certainly when I was running my own businesses, they said, nah, that'll never work. Why did you choose that title? Well, that's pretty simple because basically most of the ideas that you come up with are pretty crazy on the surface and maybe even crazy a few feet below the surface. And when I began telling everyone about this crazy idea that we had to rent video by mail, um, that's what they said was that'll never work. And that came from employees that came from the people we pitched to raise money. It even came from my wife. And it was pretty universally panned as an idea. So why, Mark, did people think it never would work because folks enjoyed going into a store and getting their videos and seeing it all kind of up there on the shelves? I remember that. I'm not too young for that. Yeah, there was a, that was probably the dominant reason why everyone thought that video rental by mail was pretty crazy. Because at the time, this is back in 1997 when we were pitching this, there was uh, 9,000 blockbuster stores. Wow. I mean, you could basically throw a rock from pretty much anywhere in the country, even in the world, even and hit a blockbuster store. And so people couldn't understand how we possibly thought that somebody would be willing to go online, order a movie, wait two or three days for it to arrive when they could just pop in their car or walk down the block and be at a blockbuster store. It just seemed completely irrational. And, and the weird thing is that you know, the idea as originally envisioned, in fact, the idea as originally launched didn't work. I mean, it was a bad idea, and, which is why kind of the subtitle for the book is The Amazing Life of an Idea, because most of these ideas you have are not what the final business is. They're not the be all and end all. They're just a starting point. And it really, what makes success in a company is where you take it from there. So, Mark, what was the idea that didn't work? And then I guess you evolved it into mailing the DVDs by, by mail. Well, the, the, the original idea that didn't work was VHS, because this ah. was back in the summer of 1997. And as you may remember, back then, back in the good old days, all video came on VHS cassettes. And it didn't take a lot of research for me to realize that's not going to work. Unless you're like but me, who had a Betamax, work. right? <laughs> exactly. But the, yeah, it's even less likely to work for right. you. Uh, but, you know, the breakthrough came maybe a month or so after we originally had the idea and we learned about this new technology called the DVD. And it was, it was in test market in San Francisco and it was small and it was light. And we realized that we might actually be able to mail this thing, like using an envelope and a stamp. And so to validate that, Reed Hastings, my business partner, and I turned the car around. We were commuting at the time and drove back down to Santa Cruz where we lived and actually went and bought a music CD because there was no DVDs to be found. And we mailed it to Reed's house in Santa Cruz and it got there in less than a day for the price of a stamp. And that's when we realized, wow, we actually might be able to make this work. And so the, the business that launched, this was in April now of 1998, was mailing people DVDs through the mail. And it took anywhere from one to three days to arrive and we had due dates and we had late fees and you had to mail it back. 
uh, and we charged a you know a four dollar per rental charge. Pretty much the only real innovation here was the fact that we had a single store uh, that we were serving the whole country from, rather than trying to build out a chain of uh, franchises or something like that. I remember I was an alert subscriber, and I was excited when those red envelopes came in the mail. Yeah, it, there was. We were wrong about some things, and in fact, people were willing to rent DVDs, but reluctantly, but only for a weird reason. Only because there just was no other place to get a DVD. That for those first few years, while the installed base was building out, you know, none of the video stores had any incentive to stock DVDs. There might only be a handful of players in their whole neighborhood. Whereas for us, we were the only place to come. And so we were getting pretty much anybody with a DVD player coming to get their DVDs from us. Our problem is that it really was a pretty unsatisfactory experience. And even though we could maybe get someone to rent from us once, we'd have pretty much no repeat business. And they were small orders and it, it was a dog. And we struggled for a year and a half uh, trying to find something that could unlock uh, video rental by mail. But it really wasn't until a year and a half later you know, in the fall of 1999 that we finally stumbled on this even more crazy idea of doing it, A, as a subscription, and B, eliminating due dates and late fees altogether. Just let people keep the discs as long as they want, and when they were, they were done, they just mailed one back, and we'd ship them the next one. Yeah. And, boy, that was an idea that even more people thought would never work. But as these strange stories sometimes turn out, it did work, and it worked really, really well. And that was really was my next question, because I think initially it was like three a month, and then you went to unlimited. Were you afraid about the financial risk of doing that? Uh, no, because there was a natural, there was two natural governors at work. One is, you know, you're only allowed to keep out three at a time or four at a time. We had different plans. And so the rate that you could turn them back and forth was limited. I mean, someone, if they really worked at it, might have been able to do 20 movies in a month. And that would have been a, a definitely a big money loser. But the second thing we had going for us was human nature. And that the reality is that most people don't watch that much. And what they were really doing was not using Netflix as a way to consume millions of movies. They were using it for incredible convenience. That now it turned this whole idea of immediacy on its head. Because now, ironically, we were faster than Blockbuster. If you wanted to watch a movie, there was three or four sitting on top of your TV. Right. It was it literally two steps away. Right. It was in your, already in your home. You didn't have to go to the store. Exactly. And so that was what turned out to be the key. It was convenience. And so the average renter was not renting 20 times a month. They were renting at a more reasonable rate. One that, and this is going to be a strange thing for right before the whole dot-com bust, where we actually could charge people more for the service than it costs us to deliver it. So actually having a uh, net positive business model was a pretty cool thing. Especially during before the, uh, the, the dot-com bust. My understanding is you got an offer from Blockbuster somewhere around 2000. Tell us about that and what was the offer and why didn't you take it? Well, I'm afraid it wasn't a, an offer from Blockbuster, unfortunately so. In fact, it was the opposite. We wanted an offer. Uh, and the reality is this crazy plan that I just described to you with the no due dates and no late fees and a subscription service was complicated. And so my idea was, well, let's just do a first month free. Let them experience the magic that is Netflix and all work itself out. And it worked incredibly well, as I mentioned. But what that meant is that the more orders that came in, on one hand, I was going, this is fantastic. But the other hand, I'm going, boy, every order coming in is costing us money for the first free month and the acquisition cost. And so the irony is we were losing a fortune in cash flow. And worse, the way that normally we'd be very comfortable um, funding the short-term cash flow issue was by raising money from VCs. But this was in the year 2000. Right, not a good right year. At the tail end. <laughs> no, definitely not. And so we were desperate. And in fact, ironically, we were going broke uh, we were from our success. And so we go, wow, we're stuck here. And so we decided pretty much the only way out is Blockbuster. And we tried to sell ourselves to Blockbuster. We flew to Blockbuster. We made our case that they should buy us and we would run the online business. They'd run the stores. Um, we'd find the synergies and boom. And 
they asked what, uh, how much they thought um, we were worth, and we said, well, we think about $50 million. That's not coincidentally. That was exactly how much money we were in the hole for at the time. Um, and they pretty much, they didn't laugh, but they came close. And so rather than us turning down an offer, this meant wow. us flying home empty-handed with this feeling of desperation because we knew there was no way around. And now there's not going to be some magic, you know, deus ex machina that comes down and saves us. Now we would actually have to figure this out. And worse, the only way out was through. It was by taking on Blockbuster directly. I got to believe that whoever made those decisions at Blockbuster, they got to be thinking, well, that was kind of a bad decision that I made. Yeah, it's kind of funny because um, just, a, you know, a couple months ago, back in early November, I was at um, a film festival seeing this Netflix, uh, for a release of a Netflix documentary. And with us there were two, uh, with the ex-COO of, of Blockbuster as well as the person who ran Blockbuster Online. And it was fantastic talking through the two sides and how they both felt about it. And yes, did they miss that big opportunity to buy us? Yes. But then there was other times when they felt they had us on the ropes and other times that we thought we had them on the ropes. This was an amazing, an amazing time. Uh, seeing us going through that actual pitched battle once they finally decided they had to take us seriously. So, Mark, in hindsight, why do you think that you at Netflix was able to do something that Blockbuster wasn't able to do? Was it because you were coming from outside the industry as a disruptor that we see so often? Yes, but not. I don't. I, I put less credence on the outside the industry. Although it is true, you know, this is a handful of people with zero experience in the video business taking down six billion dollar corporation. But I think the thing that took down Blockbuster was the same thing that takes down every established large player, which is this hesitancy, this unwillingness, this fear, this inability to be willing to cannibalize their past in order to invest in what the future is. Blockbuster saw it. They saw what was happening. They knew that unless they were able to get into the online business, they were going to go down. But it still was almost impossible in an organization with 60,000 employees for them to say, let's take our A team and take them off the $6 billion of business and put them on the half a million dollars worth of business. And by the time they eventually came to the realization that, wow, we're going to have to invest, we're going to have to move our resources, we're going to have to do things which hurt us in the short term, it was too late. Wow. Now, now, Netflix created people calling out binge watching, and it really did something that <clears throat> nobody else did at the time, which was, hey, let's release all the episodes at one time, like House of Cards. Where did that come from? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so it came from the place that most of these innovations came from. It came from starting with what the customer really wants. And as Netflix kind of looked at, as they began moving into original content um, and began releasing things on their own, they were saying to themselves, what do customers really want? And what we realized is that most of the ways that television was being presented was legacy. In, for example, it was all 30 minutes long, which is arbitrary based on the time slots of television. Uh, it was, in fact, not 30 minutes. It was 22 minutes right. to make room for the, the commercials. commercials. The, these 30 minutes were broken up into four to five three to four minute segments. So each of those segments had to have its own story arc, which means you had to have things very compressed and very over the top. You had to start every 30 minute episode with a recitation of where you were when you left off last week. You had to end it with a cliffhanger. Now, are these things because they've been determined to be the ultimate way to tell a story? Absolutely not. And so once you begin releasing creative talent, and they say, how long do you want the episodes to be? And they go, I don't know, whatever you want, whatever you think is gonna work for telling your story. Uh, and are they going to be released once a week? No, they'll be all simultaneous, so you can begin building story arcs that move over multiple episodes, with the, except with the understanding people will watch them as long as they want to watch them. In other words, this is not like us sitting down and redesigning what television should look like. This is basically saying it's a new medium, it's a new way of distributing content. What should content look like and how should it be delivered to take advantage of this new medium? Well, I saw statistics said now 60% of Americans binge watch, so you guys were right. Tell us what you're up to now, Mark, besides uh, going out there and talking about the book. So, uh, you know, I, I left Netflix actually nearly 15 right. years ago now, 16 years ago. And Netflix was my sixth startup. Um, and so I was kind of at a point where I was not sure I had it in me to start another company. Um, 
But, you know, once you have this in your blood, you can't stop. So I couldn't go cold turkey and go off and play golf or fish, and so I don't like either of those things. <laughs> I needed some way, to, some way to get my fix. And it took a while. I had to kind of do a little business plan for myself, but ultimately realized that the best way to get what I wanted was to mentor other early-stage entrepreneurs to help them with their startups. Because it turns out the thing that I loved best about that Netflix experience was, you know, coming into the office and sitting around the table with really smart people and getting to solve these really interesting puzzles. And that now I could do that, but rather than being for my company, I could be doing that with someone else's company. That I could get in deep enough and know the product and know the people and know the competitors so that I could sit around their table with them and help them solve really interesting puzzles. And even better, I got get to go home at night. <laughs> Absolutely, um, it, it really was the perfect match for me. And unfortunately, I did get sucked into starting to helping start another company after that, which we just you know, it, it's uh, we called the Looker Data, and we sold it to the deal with selling it to Google is just about to close. So that chapter will come to an end. And I swear, I swear, you never s- again. I'm you done. S- <laughs> It's hard for an entrepreneur to swear that. <clears throat> Mark, thanks so much for being on the show. The title of the book is That Will Never Work, The Birth of Netflix and the Amazing Life of an Idea. Appreciate you joining us. Oh, thanks so much for the time. This is AMA 20 WCPT in Chicago. We'll be right back. I know a lot of small business owners are confused about where to advertise online and how to actually get results. You got to be diligent because you can lose a lot of money fast if you don't choose the right platform and the right audience. The question I always get is, should I advertise on a search engine like Google or a social media platform like LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. For small business owners, LinkedIn is the place to drive brand awareness, generate leads, and build long-term purposeful relationships that result in boosting their business. This is because effective search engine advertising should target audiences, not keywords. LinkedIn's network has more than 575 members, and their advertising gives you the ability to effectively target the right message to the right people while they're working. It has the marketing tools to help you target your customers with precision, down to their job title, company name, and industry. In fact, four to five customers who are on LinkedIn are decision makers at their company, so you're building relationships with the people that really matter. This will result in higher quality leads and more website traffic. So to redeem a $100 free LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign, please use this website for listeners of Small Business Radio Show. You got to go to linkedin.com slash SBR. That's linkedin.com slash SBR for your free $100 ad credit. Remember that terms and conditions apply. Let me know about your results. You've already upgraded your cell phone to a smart device, which lets you use the internet to be more productive on the go. But what about your desk phone? Nextiva. Nextiva is a smart business phone system in the cloud. With a simple setup through an internet connection, you can soon have access to your office communications wherever you are. Stay seamlessly connected with clients and stay more mobile than ever before with just one low monthly cost. Give your business more than just a basic desk phone. Visit nextiva.com or call 800-799-0600 to learn more today. Nextiva. Nextiva. Simplifying your business communications. Tune in regularly to my show, then you know that I talk to many different businesses across the country, different types of people, different backgrounds, all kinds of industries, but there's one thing that unites all of us, searching that thing known as work-life balance. I get pretty bummed out when a listener tells me that they haven't been home for dinner in a whole month. That's why I'm so excited to introduce you to Visita. Visita does a lot for one little application. It can help you achieve that lifestyle. Visita is that personal assistant on steroids you never had. It syncs your client information, appointments, and payments. Visita sends automated appointments and payment reminders, making sure your clients keep appointments and get paid on time. Visita understands today's consumer, making it easy for them to book an appointment and pay from literally anywhere. A website, Facebook, emails, even your Google My Business profile. It's also compatible with Google, Gmail, iCal, social media, and Square Payments. So get your free 14-day trial during which you can explore every single feature. Go to vcita.com. That's V-C-I-T-A dot com. No credit card required. No strings attached. No brainer. And when you're ready to buy, use promo code Barry10 to get 10% off. Stick around to get your small business unstuck. More of Small Business Radio with Barry Moltz. Now on WCPT 820, Chicago's Progressive Talk. 
Well, I'm back here at the Bead SMB Global Conference. What is the best way to find people to work in your company, especially in this environment of almost full employment? Employment Here to help is Raj Mukherjee, who's the Senior Vice President of Product and GM of Small Business at Indeed. Raj, thanks for joining me here. Thank you, Barry, really appreciate it. So Indeed is almost, in my mind, as ubiquitous as Craigslist, right? Everybody knows about Indeed if they're going to look for a job. Tell us about the origin story of Indeed. How did you get started? Yeah, I mean, you're being kind. Not everybody knows us yet. You wish, right? I wish. That's your I job. Wish. That's my job. That's my job to make sure everybody knows about us. Uh, but broadly, I mean, yes, we got started in 2004 timeframe, more than 15 years back, with this simple core notion that we're going to aggregate all jobs. And from a job seeker perspective, people looking for people looking for jobs, it's actually really hard to go to all these different sites and look for them, right? So we decided we're going to aggregate all of the jobs in one place, so a job seeker could find the jobs in one location. That was the genesis of Indeed. So whose idea was it? Uh, Ronnie Kahan, who was the founder of this company, uh, he was the product mind behind all of this. I call it job aggregation, getting, we call it one search all jobs. And that was definitely him. So I'm trying to think back to 15 years ago, I wasn't sure what it was around, but I think Monster was at least around, right? Absolutely. So wasn't that a place where people go look for jobs? Why did we need Indeed? Very true. I mean, Monster was there. There was actually quite a few, if I remember right. I was still pretty nascent in my job search then, but it was there. And uh, I do remember having to go to each of these sites and not find the jobs I looked for. Every site would have their own set of jobs, but you couldn't quite get the whole list of jobs. And that was what Indeed did. It started aggregating all jobs across all of these sites, putting them in one place. So if I am looking for a job, I don't have to go to 20 places. So when you say all in one place, how does it actually work? Yeah, so at a high level, think of it as you are going in, you're looking for any source of job, wherever it is, anything that's online, you are going and crawling that and putting that information into one place and effectively making it easy for a job seeker to see all of that information and make the applies that they want to. Now, when Indeed began in the early days, it was, think of it as a clicks-based system, right? So you come in, you look for the job, you click on it, and that takes you away from Indeed. It takes you into God knows where, we don't know. And over time, we have realized that's not a great job seeker experience, it's also not a great employer experience. Um, in some cases, employers have a very legitimate reason for the job to go to their site, we get that. But for especially small and medium businesses, which is what we're talking about in this conference, it's very hard for them to actually have their own website, manage all their jobs, all of that stuff. So we decided to provide a very simple way to capture the applies on our system. So you came in, you could post your job on Indeed. You could essentially manage all your candidates on Indeed once they've applied. You could even make a hire on Indeed. And hence, what we keep talking about, our CEO, Chris Iams, keeps talking about this very simple strategy, which is getting closer to the hire. And that, in a sense, means how do we help every employer find the best possible hire they can make, and every job seeker find the best possible job they can get. So how do you actually make money? Because I think, I haven't, I haven't used Indeed for, for a few months now, but I feel that part of it's free. <laughs> yes, that's very true. So I'll give you our strategy. Uh, we let, let people come in, or we aggregate jobs for free. We also let people post for free. There's, we don't charge anything for that. Uh, you can actually make a hire for free. You can do use all our services for free. You can decide never to wake up and give us a dime. And many people don't. The good part is we have enough data to show that if you do pay, you can hire faster. You can hire better qualified candidates. And that is matters to a lot of people as well. And so they decide at some point through the data that we have that it's helpful for them to actually upgrade to our what we call sponsored jobs. So essentially getting more visibility for their jobs so that they get more applies and more and more, more qualified applies that helps them make those hires. So Raj, why did you guys decide to go this freemium model? You know, a lot of folks don't do that where their website's free and then they try to convert them to more paid. A lot of the job sites, you know, it costs 300 bucks or $500 to post something. Why did you decide to go in that direction? You know, you're preempting a conversation I'm going to have this later this afternoon about exactly this. Uh, our whole thesis was, if you have to reach a wider, much wider set of audience than it is online. Right, so it's, you can think of a market as it exists today and you can say I want more market share. Or you can think of how can I expand the market? How can I get everyone online 
who are not even online. They're not even thinking of coming online because the cost is prohibitive for them. If as a smaller business, I mean, imagine your neighborhood coffee shop, they have to pay 500 bucks to post a job for a barista. That may not be possible for them. But by allowing them to post a job for free, by giving them an opportunity to try before they buy, and making, in many cases, making them successful without paying a dime, you are expanding the market significantly. And in the process, helping them create memories that they'll never forget. Because those memories, they will always remember that, hey, I got value from Indeed, I'm going to come back and use Indeed again. So the biggest question, Raj, that small business owners have now is that we pretty much live, at least right now, in a full employment economy. Mm -hmm. How do I find people that work that can work with me because that's the limiting factor? A lot of folks think, I'm not even going to go on a, a job board because anybody that is any good will already have a job. <laughs> I think, well, look, that... We keep hearing that that is... Yeah, we go back. So so one of the things that small business owners really face now is they say, uh, what's really holding me back is I need people. But where the heck do I find them? They're afraid to go on any kind of posted job board because they think to themselves, anybody that's any good these days already has a job, Raj. I think, look, there is some truth to this concept of employment being the best it has been. Like if you're a job seeker, you have lots and lots of choices and this is the best time to look for a job, actually. But at the same time, there are people who are not in the marketplace right now, in the labor marketplace. They're still not there. There are many people who have been underemployed. Our unemployment rate doesn't count those underemployed people. So when you put all of that in perspective, there's a lot of people whose skills are not matched with the jobs that they want. I actually think the biggest problem in our entire economy is not that we have a oversupply or over demand. We actually don't have the best matching. And because there, that matching is not happening, you have dissatisfied employees. And there's some studies that show 68% of employees are disengaged. They're just unhappy about their job that they're in. Can you imagine that? Oh, I believe that. I'm surprised the number is not even higher. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so matching, I think, is really important. I also find that when people use these kinds of services, folks that aren't even qualified mm -hmm. actually apply for the job. So what is best practices on what, as a small business owner, I should post, Raj? It's a very good question. And, uh, I mean, to make it very explicit, what you're saying is you put a, put a job on Indeed, you have no idea whether your job requirements are going to be understood number one, but even if they're understood, whether they would care. They, it's a free-for-all economy, right? So they can apply to your job, and you wouldn't have an ability to stop that. What we are doing over and, and again, over the call it next few years, we will do it even more. We are enabling job seekers to really understand if this is a good job for them. If the core essence of matching comes down to, let's say I, I post, let's take a hypothetical example. I'm going to post a job that requires three years of customer service experience. I want that person in downtown Chicago. I want that person to have worked in the financial services industry. That's, I'm a small trading firm. That's what I want, this person to come in and apply. I, get, I have to make it really explicit through my job that those are the requirements I'm looking for. They are must-have requirements, that I don't want to select anyone if they don't meet these three requirements, at least three years of customer service experience. They have to be able to work in downtown Chicago, so they probably have to be living within a reasonable distance of that. And they have to have financial services industry experience. Once you do that, once you enable them to, again, pre-select, we introduce something called screener questions. So these screener questions are really important because as the, poll, as the job is posted, we will guide you through those questions. So you can ask for that. We will add another screener question here. Let's say work authorization. So you need work authorization to be able to work in US. So you want that as the question as well. So anybody else who is applying, they actually see these are the four requirements. I cannot really apply to this job and have a shot at even getting a call back or a reply back if I don't meet these requirements. That's good, that's step one. Step two is, how do you think about assessing the skills of those employees that you're trying to hire? So in this case, customer service. We have built a corpus of what we call pre-created assessments by our experts. And these assessments are actually testing people on their work that they will do in the future. I mean, one of the best ways to identify if somebody would be successful, I mean, you as this incredible communicator, would you be successful if you didn't know that you can communicate, right? So how do we know? My wife doesn't think I'm such a big communicator, but that's a little different story. <laughs> well, we, we, can, we can share that with your wife, that I feel personally that you're a great communicator. Well, thanks, Raj. I may call you up later tonight. <laughs> but that, that whole concept of you have to use a work sample based test to identify. And that's the second step. First step is screener questions, your job description and your screener questions. Second step, you have work sample based tests 
that identify whether I'm going to be a really good customer service agent or not. And once you have done all of that, we actually really help you guide through in our dashboard. We call it a dashboard where you can see a short list of candidates that meet your criteria. And that should lead you to hire. I think this is really important because when I've used Indeed, I get so many candidates, mm -hmm. it's hard to filter through them. And I think the screener questions is a great way to go, as well as be able to test people before you even bring them in for an interview. Mm -hmm. Because the filtering and the funneling is it is really a productivity booster because if I got to go through 100 resumes and I got to talk to 15 people to get the one, that's hard. I'll share some statistics with you that I'm allowed by Jane now to share. Uh, we have been able to reduce time to hire by 27% for small businesses. I mean, all, all employers, but particularly think of small businesses, they don't have time. So when you think about that 27% reduction, it's a huge thing that we have, we, we feel we have done from productivity boost perspective. And, and that's critical. The other thing is a lot of folks will list the skills they need. I find what people don't do is talk about the culture of the company or the mission of the company. From your mind seeing, being in this industry, how important is that to find the right candidate? Uh, if I quote Drucker, culture is everything, right? So when you think about what small businesses want, I mean, and also larger companies, this is just becoming across the board true, you want to hire people who will be a good cultural match for your company or organization. One of the things we see at Indeed is oftentimes people will go through that first phone screen, and I'll, I'll share an experience last year, where we have this annual conference called Interactive. And I was talking to someone who is a gym, gym owner. Like she has a, she's a trainer in a gym and she also owns a gym. And she said, look, I like your phone assessment. I like your screener questions. They're all good. But how do I really know I can work with this person? I need to see this person. I need to be able to have a conversation with this person. How do you guys enable that to come to life? And so I walked her through an experience of where she can show a day in the life of being a trainer in her gym in our company pages. So we have this very simple product, again, available for free, pretty much everything at Indeed you can do for free. So you come in over here, you create your company page, you talk about what you want in the people that you're looking to hire, you share your own video, you actually showcase your company, and this person actually did that after afterwards. It was a very clear way for her to articulate. This is what I want in people who want to work with me in my company. I'm bringing in a family member. I have only 10 people in my gym. I want, I'm bringing the 11th person. This is what a family member needs to look like. And this is how we work together. And it was really eye-opening for her that she could do that with like literally her mobile phone. Take some pictures, create a little video, post it, add some notes, and she's there. And I'm not suggesting that you can only can do it with Scrappy. I mean, there's a way to actually pay for a premium product on this as well, where you can get very sophisticated. You can do a lot more things. But you could start with the simple one and see if it works for you. And we know that, I mean, I'll share another data that's really powerful here. For job seekers who come in, who get to see your jobs, you get 4x more applies when you have a company page. And people who are visiting your company page, they're 4x more likely to actually apply to your job. That's a pretty big deal. Well, and what I like about Indeed is doing, you're looking at the entire process, not just finding the people who are getting the resume, because that's just the start. That's right. That's the start. The last question I want to ask you is, we're here at the Beat SMB Global Conference. Tell us why you come and what you hope to get out of it. You know, the best thing I like about this conference is it is a set of people that I would love to have in my shortlist to meet every year or every six months to talk about problems small businesses face. They're all thought leaders in this space. They're, yes, they're my friends, but they're also peers that I can learn from. And they share their studies. They share their experiences in how they're helping small businesses across the globe. And that's something I can take back, like tomorrow, when I leave, and learn and use that in my business, and help small businesses globally get better experience from Indeed. Raj, thanks for joining us so much. There's an important step when it comes to tax season that every small business owner dreads. It's organizing and sending those W-2s to your employees and 1099s to all your independent contractors if you paid them over $600 in the past year. But now there's an easier way to file and deliver those 1099s and W-2s by January 31st, 2020. Introducing eFileForBiz.com, an all-inclusive print, mail, and e-file service for every small business owner. This tool allows you to easily import data from Excel, QuickBooks, and Xero. It's faster to process than ordering paper forms from the IRS and having to fill them out and mail them. eFile for Biz requires no software to be installed. Let eFileForBiz.com process, print, and mail 1099s and W-2s for you. Try it free at www.efileforbiz.com. 
Yes, tax season is here, and Blue Summit Supplies wants to make filing your 1099s and W-2s quicker, cheaper, and easier than ever. Reduce the stress of tax season by stocking up on IRS-compliant tax form kits for 1099s, W-2s, plus learn how you can save time, money by filing your 2019 taxes online using a simple, safe, and secure electronic filing system. Learn more at bluesummitsupplies.com slash SBR. That's bluesummitsupplies.com slash SBR and use code SBR10 at checkout to save 10% on your order for any paper tax forms or envelopes. Stick around to get your small business unstuck. More of Small Business Radio with Barry Moltz. Now on WCPT 820, Chicago's Progressive Talk. Well, along with every happy new year comes the next phrase, and it's tax time again. Small businesses are not only responsible for filing their state and federal income taxes every year, but they also need to file informational returns. These are the W-2s and 1099s that tell the IRS how much you paid your employees and contractors, and this has to be done by January 31st. Here to help sort out is Jamie Lazad, who's the HR and Tax Compliance Solutions Manager at ComplyRight. She has managed and developed numerous HR solutions from training tools and safety products to HR and tax reporting software. Jamie, welcome back to the show and Happy New Year to you. Thank you so much, Barry. You as well. So and first, the season to tax season, right? It's, it's introduction to tax season. It's that sprint now to January 31st. Tell us about what small business owners have to do in regards to W-2s and 1099s by January 31st. What's required by law? Well, uh, for the W-2s and the 1099s, um, as you mentioned, uh, that's the, those are the information reporting for, forms that they need to fill out and then um, file with the IRS so that the IRS can then have the information um, and the individuals can file their own personal tax returns. Um, but they also have to send a copy of that, that information return to the recipient so, again, they can file their, uh, their personal information returns. And why is this really required by the IRS? It's required because, like I mentioned, this information that the IRS re- collects is what matches up when the, in, the employees or the contractors, um, whether you're filing a W-2 or 1099, it's what matches up the personal return to what the business filed. Um, so they're looking at the numbers that the business information is, the business is reporting on the information returns. For instance, you have an employee, you file the W-2 form, they made $72,000 this year. When that employee files their personal information returns, they're going to look to match up that, that um, annual amount of information based on the information return that they filed, as well as what they send in for their 1040 personal tax return. So that information is, is what the IRS looks for um, to match up and make sure that um, things are cohesive um, with what the business is reporting and then, again, what the employee, employee is reporting. So let's imagine a couple scenarios. Let's say that uh, someone doesn't file their personal income taxes, but the government received a W-2 from a business. They know that this person earned money, right? Yes. Obviously, it puts it out there. So there's a there's a uh, a big red flag right there showing that businesses saying that they sent they paid you a certain amount of money for work that was done that year, whether it, it was as an employee or a contractor. So that's going to give the IRS a red flag to say, hey, you guys didn't fi- you didn't file your taxes. What's going on? And the same thing goes with the 10 and nines. I mean, for small businesses that do a lot of contract work for people, you're supposed to take all the 10 and nines you get, and that's included in the the, the revenue or the money that you earned and Again, if they if the government gets a 1099 and you didn't include that in your income as a business, that's going to be a problem. Correct. Uh, definitely, if it's over the threshold of $600, which is what the requirement is when filing a, a 1099 miscellaneous for contractors. So I find that I always get 1099s usually as a subset of my income. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of business out there that don't follow or don't file the 1099s. Yeah, um, you know, and some uh, some of the reasons may be that they they don't know. Um, you know, one of my biggest things uh, that I always say to small business owners is what you don't you don't know what you don't know until you know. So if they're a small business owner that didn't do their homework to understand the types of workers that they're working with, whether they're employees or contractors, and the rules and, and regulations that come around. Um, that come with those workers, then they're not going to know what the reporting requirements are at the end of the year. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're, you know, just because they don't know doesn't mean that um, 
it keeps them from, you know, being put aside to say, oh, well, you didn't know it's a slap on the it's slap a slap on the wrist. Uh, they have to know in order to remain compliant. So it's their responsibility, um, and they need to do their due diligence to understand what it means to work with the different type of workers in the in the um, business industry, whether it's a contractor or an employee, and the regulations that go through having the employee throughout the year and then end of the year reporting requirements for the federal government. Yeah, absolutely. People really have to understand is just because you didn't know, that doesn't absolve you from any penalty you might get from the IRS, right? Exactly. There's no slap on the wrist for that. They're expecting you as a business owner to understand what those requirements are. And there are a ton of resources out there, especially with us through Comply Right and eFile for Biz, that can share and help small business owners to understand what is needed and help within those compliance arenas. You know, it's interesting for me, one of my clients got audited and they never filed 1099s. And he said, well, I thought that if I had to file 1099s, my accountant would have told me. And that didn't really work as an excuse to the IRS. <laughs> Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, they, they don't take, well, I didn't know. <laughs> That's not an, ex, an, an acceptable answer for them. So does this information also go to the states for their tax returns? Yes, um, there is actually a program with the IRS um, when filing um, where they call it the Combined Federal State Filing Program. And if one of those states, there are only, there are only a certain number of states that participate in that program. And when filing with the IRS, say, if you're e-filing, um, that they participate in, and um, the IRS will then share that information with the state to make it available to them, which can, you know, um, remove the burden of having to do a duplicate process of filing to this state. However, um, you know, some states don't require you to file information with the W-2s or the 1099s. Some do require you to file separately. Um, it's really the business owner's duty to, again, understand what both the federal requirements are as well as the state requirements of where they're doing business to make sure that they are fully requirements. So um, to answer your question um, in a short way, yes, yeah, there are also state requirements. So it's not just federal requirements that the business may have to uh, make sure that they follow. Do, they, do a lot of the states not require the filings because they get the information from the federal tax returns of the individuals or the businesses? There are quite a few states. Um, I think I want to say it's somewhere around 30 um, states that actually do take that information. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say what they do is they take that information, that's if you're e-filing. If you're paper filing, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, go for the same thing. It's only when you're e-filing that the combined federal state filing program uh, works. So if you're paper filing, you must send to the IRS, but you also must Send to your state. Um, now, in the e-filing or er, er, in the e-filing process, the IRS, like I mentioned, what they'll do is they'll make that information available to the state. So it is the state's uh, duty to make sure they go and grab it. Um, but obviously, it is the business owner's sole duty to make sure that their state filing requirements were met. Um, so sometimes, you know, they want to reach out to the state to make sure that they did receive their um, their. Uh, forms and, and the information and stuff like that to make sure that they are compliant. Um, because there is no receipt that the IRS sends back saying, we gave this to your state. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. So let's talk about how this looks like. Well, first of all, if you're going to do it by paper, this is not just a form you can download off the web for free. I mean, it's one of the only forms that you can't get for free on the web, I found. With the 1099s or W-2s? With the 1099s. Uh, yes. Um, you know, it's you want to make sure you're filling out the right form, first right. of all, and you want to make sure you have the most up-to-date form. Um, so, you know, it, whether you're, you know, obviously the, the easiest way to go is to e-file. Um, it saves a lot of burden from the small business owner, especially when you only have a few forms to file. Um, it saves you from having, going, from having to go to the store, purchase, you know, a, a 25 or 50 pack of forms when you only need two or three. Plus, you also have to purchase the envelopes and then you have to go get the stamps. Um, so e-filing, um, most sites and especially e-file for biz, you only pay for what you file. So um, you just basically can create an account very easily. It's free. And you go on, fill out the form, um, and it even guides you on how to fill it out, meaning it makes sure that you have the required fields that are needed in order to be able to send to send off to the IRS to properly e-file. And this um, is so Jamie along the, those lines as well. Yeah, this is important because when you fill out a form, you send it in, you don't know if you filled it out correctly, you don't know if all the information is there. So if you're doing e-filing, at least you have also all, all the fields have to be filled out plus you have a receipt of that you actually sent it in. 
Exactly. Yep. It shows you exactly what date you sent it in. It does also tell you wow, whether it was accepted by the IRS or not and when. And it also set, it also shows you, because there is an option to use what we call the print and mail service, where we'll not only e-file to the IRS, but also send those copies to your recipients. And it'll actually put a stamp of the date that it was sent to the recipient so that you can ensure that it was sent out on time to meet that January 31st deadline. So, Jimmy, what documentation should I have had uh, after the 31st of this year, this is year to make sure that I'm able to fill these out easily? Am I just going to my payroll system for this information? Most of the information, yeah, it's going to come from your payroll. Um, obviously, you want to make sure that your employee records are kept up to date besides just the data that you need for the wages that were paid out. Um, you know, that's going to come from your payroll, which your address, your address information and all that should be updated in your payroll system as well. Um, so it's important, you know, um, we are here uh, approaching um, January, you know, the beginning of the month uh, and the beginning of the new year. So, you know, it's a little bit late to go back and do some, some backtracking and stuff, but the time is now to make sure that your records are updated, that you have the correct addresses on file for your employees and your contractors, and most importantly, um, that you have the correct SSNs or the correct tax identification numbers for contractors, because those are important and those are, those are much needed in order to fill out those forms and send them to the IRS and make sure that they are filed correctly and on time. And the employees and the contractors that I say are on the ball are really with it. If you don't send it to them by January 31st, they're going to come knocking at your door. Most definitely. I mean, they could, you know, sometimes, you know, it usually sometimes it'll take a couple days, you know, maybe a week or two that they'll give. But if it's any it's any later than that, most definitely, because as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, this is the information that the employees and the contractors use to file their personal information returns. And we know at the beginning of the year, everybody wants to file their taxes right away to get that check back in the mail. Right. So when they're not receiving that information from you, they they have to wait to file their returns. So that's why it's important, one, to meet that deadline of January 31st. However, there is a chance that if you mail it by the 31st, the dead, what the deadline imposes is that you have to have, a business has to have the envelope postmarked with the date 131. So as long as it goes out on January 31st and the envelope is postmarked with the date of 131, then that business has satisfied, satisfied of meeting the, that deadline of January 31st. If it goes out a day after, then obviously they're not, they don't remain in compliance. Now, if a business is sending it out on January 31st, meeting the deadline, obviously that doesn't mean that the recipient's going to receive it by then. It could take, you know, a few days up to a week for a recipient to receive their copy in the mail. And that is obviously if the address is right um, on the envelope that they mailed. So that's where they want to make sure that that information is correct. And I want to people to really understand that just as much as filing taxes is your business obligations, these informational returns, they don't take second place. They're just as important. Yes. Oh, most definitely, because there can be penalties, um, and that's per form um, for information returns that are not filed, uh, because, again, this is what the IRS matches up according to personal taxes that are filed, and this is what they look at um, based on what you paid out to those contractors and those employees that you worked with throughout the year as a business. I also want to make a point. I said before that I don't always receive 1099s from everyone that I've done work with, but my recommendation is that you still file that income and pay tax on that because A, it's the right thing to do, and B, you never know when that particular company is going to amend their information returns, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, as a, as a contractor, um, I mean, you're, you want to make sure that you're um, including that information as an employee. Um, you know, sometimes people will use their last paycheck or their pay stub um, if they haven't received a W-2 as of yet. Um, I know a lot of places will allow <clears throat> filings to happen, uh, you know, when they're doing the personal taxes to happen that way. So most definitely you want to be accurate when you're filing your own personal taxes um, because you don't want that to come and bite you in the end um, on your personal side. The business can get that taken care of. You know, the, biz the IRS can, can take care of um, throwing penalties to the business on their side. But you, as obviously, if you're a contractor or an employee or anything like that, you want to pro protect yourself. And, and you bring up a good point. If you're an employee and you don't receive this as much as you ask the company for it, you can try to use your last paycheck because it should have the total that you paid uh, in, that you got paid plus all your taxes, right? Correct. Yeah, your pay, your last pay stub usually, and and every pay stub has your year-to-date earnings. 
Um, so obviously with the last pay stub that you received for the year, that should have your yearly earning, your earnings for the year, which is the same of what you need to end, um, to fill out your uh, personal um, tax returns. And for contractors, hopefully you've kept track of all the money that's been coming into your company. So if you don't get a 1089, you can use that number as well. Correct. Correct. And obviously, you know, bank statements or anything like that if you weren't receiving an invoice or anything like that. So where can people go really to help them file this electronically? And I highly recommend that you do it electronically and not mess around with the forms anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the, a place that they can go to is efileforbiz.com. That's the word efile, the number four, and then biz.com. And like I mentioned before, that site allows you to only file what you need to file. There is no minimum on the site. You only pay for what you file. It's free to set up an account. Uh, very easy to keep track of all of your information year over year on the site, meaning you don't have to set up new recipients every year unless you add somebody or new employees or anything like that. You can file W-2s and 1099s on the form, on the site, I'm sorry. And it's also, uh, like I mentioned, it has validation in the form. So it helps you to make sure that you're filling out all the required fields in the form and even properly as, as the validation guides you a little bit on the form. So for first-time business owners, um, it's a great site to use, very easy to access, easy to follow, and they offer not only filing to the IRS, but they offer print and mail service as well so that you can take care of everything all in one full swoop. Um, send the files to the IRS and then send them off to your recipients so that everybody gets the pieces that they need in time. Um, the fo all forms are kept on the site for four years, which is the requirement by the IRS. It is an IRS um, e-file authorized site, and it's also HIPAA and um, SOC 2 certified. So it has the highest level of security on the site to make sure that all data is encrypted while, um, while it's sitting um, in the in the site um, and in the cloud, and to make sure that it's protected. Well, Jamie, I appreciate you being on the show. And as they say this time of year, Happy New Year and welcome to tax season. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for joining this week's radio show. I want to thank our sponsors, Nextiva, the all-in-one communications platform for your small business. I also want to thank LinkedIn, the place to generate leads, drive traffic, and brand awareness for your free $100 credit to launch your campaign. Go to www.linkedin.com slash SBR. I also want to thank eFile for Biz, the easiest way to process, print, mail, and file your 1099 and W-2s for your business, go to www.efile4biz. I want to thank Visita, all you need to run your business on one software. Try for free at www.visita.com. That's V-I-C-I-T-A.com. I also want to thank Blue Summit Supplies. If you want to be able to mail in your W-2s and 1099s, go to www.bluesummitsupplies slash SBR. I got to thank our incredible staff, our booking producer, Sarah Schaffrin, our in studio producer Lady B, our marketing manager Courtney Gilchrist. If you're serious about being more successful in 2020, you got to give me a call. I've set up a private line just for you 773 837 8250, or you can email me at barry at molts.com. Remember, love everyone. Trust a few and pal your own canoe. Have a profitable and passionate week. You can find Barry Moltz on the web at barrymoltz.com or more episodes of Small Business Radio at smallbizradioshow.com.